Hello everyone, I'm John Higgins, contributing writer to Film and TV Now, and I'm delighted to welcome one and all to this interview special with author and filmmaker John Walsh, who has written a wonderful new hardback book looking at John Carpenter's 1981 classic sci-fi thriller Escape from New York, regarded as one of the directing legends best ever films in a period of production that is enviable from 1976's Assault on Precinct 13, Halloween, The Fog, the aforementioned Escape from New York, which we're talking about today, The Thing, Big Trouble in Little China, Prince of Darkness, and They Live. Um, it's The book is um, hardback, as I say, and uh, well worth your purchase if you want to get it. We'll talk a bit more about it later. So, John, a warm welcome to you. So, when did the idea of writing a book about the film come about? Well, John, great to be on. Thanks for having me on. Um, I think it really came about after my second book, which was Flash Gordon, the official story of the film. Um, publishers Titan Books were, were pleased with the way that turned out. It did very well. It coincided with that film's 40th anniversary, which was in December 2020. And we're talking about what was coming up in uh, 2021, you know, what 40th anniversary or perhaps 50th anniversary films were worth revisiting. And of course, so many popular films have had great books written about them whether it's Planets of the Apes, Star Wars, Star Trek, and so on, Alien, Blade Runner, you know, those, those films have been well and truly sort of um, mined for their jewels. So we kind of thought, well, look, Escape from New York hasn't had what it deserves to have, which is a large format making of coffee table book in terms of when you held it up there, John, look like the monolith from 2001, you, the angle yeah. you had to set. It's just a <laughs> vast book. Um, so these books are quite expensive to make. And, and of course, they're, they're a big investment from both the publisher and the licensor, the people who own um, Escape from New York. So as we did on Flash Gordon, we had to make sure that everyone who owned the IPs were, were on board. And it was an easy, it was a no-brainer for me. I mean, I love the film as I think you do, John. You, we probably both grew up watching this on VHS mm -hmm. and so on. So, um, but the, the trick with these books is you kind of think, why did nobody do a making of book before? And I thought that for Flash Gordon and, uh, for Flash Gordon, the, the difficulty was the rights were in three different places between Studio Canal, who owned the physical film, uh, King Features under Hearst Publications, who owns the character, and Universal Pictures, who released the film back in the 80s. Um, on this, it was a bit more straightforward. It was just um, Studio Canal, who were the sole licensor. But just like on Flash, when you get the rights to write the book, you don't suddenly get... Um, a, a, a sort of a secret key to the kingdom of all the photographs and artwork and everything else. So that really is a sort of an uphill struggle, finding stuff which is high res, high resolution enough. Because as you said, John, the book is large. So the photos have to kind of work in a sort of a glossy magazine style or art book layout, which is what this is. So th that's the difficulty. Are there enough photo assets? Is there enough of an interesting story to tell? So unlike Flash, this is sort of a much smaller budget film it's around six million dollars and it takes place all in one night effectively you could argue one location whereas flash gordon costs you know something in the region of 30 to 35 million dollars in 1980 there's vast amounts of costumes and special effects and different settings and so on so it was quite a challenge and uh, and i'm delighted people have received it very well it's just been nominated for a rondo award so it's my third rondo award mm -hmm. for book of the year so um yeah, Not too bad. I mean, I'll tell you about my own experience of it. I mean, most of us, we first encountered it pre-regulation in the UK on the Embassy Home Entertainment label, which was also released the likes of, um, I think at the time it was things like Road Games and Codename the Soldier, which actually played on Talking Pictures recently. So it takes me back because, I mean, I remember, I remember going into a VHS store in 1983 and I remember, you know, it was that time when you, it was a dare to go in there. And I remember to buying the tape and I actually hooked up our video recorder to a turntable and I had two speaker mono and the first thing that comes out is that wonderful score by John Carpenter and Alan Howarth which for me is probably his greatest ever score I mean there's themes in other films but the most most complete score of that thing is very good so I mean my next question to you is obviously what is it about Escape from New York in your opinion that makes it such a memorable film well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because we think of all of these films from 30 or 40 years ago. There are many that have fallen by the wayside and won't get books. And, and even John Carpenter's film here was a great success, 
but it had a, a um, in most places an, an NC17 certificate, so not everyone got to see it. It had a successful but short theatrical window. It really kind of lived on VHS and, as you say, Embassy Video, part of Avco Embassy, the uh, the production company who who funded the picture. Um, it's it's hard to say really because John Carpenter's films, all of them that you you mentioned there at the opening, kind of exist within their own little atmosphere in the way that Ray Harryhausen films do. So. Um, he has a particular sort of style and approach. And here, there's, there's sort of a, a dry wit running throughout the picture, thanks to Nick Castle's um, injections into the script with some humour. But also the, the physical shooting of it. There's lots of very wide shots. There's very little fast cutting for an action-packed film. And he doesn't fill the frame. You know, there's lots of... Um, sort of desolation within the frame. I spoke to Dean Cundy as well about this, about lighting this sort of thing and, and allowing the frame to be left empty. And, you know, he was saying to me that a, a studio would have sent notes down after seeing Rushes and would have said, no, not like this. And, and similarly with the music, you know, we can't have an electronic score. It needs to have a, an action style score. So I think John was lucky that Avco Embassy were a large independent and allowed him, as it were, his head and allowed him to create this environment right the way down to choosing the type font for the for the opening titles so he really was in his film school element here being in charge of every aspect of it and as we move on to films like the thing big trouble in little china starman and uh, and and even the remake escape from la these were studio pictures and the experience for carpenter wasn't as positive and of course the audience reception wasn't either escape from new york was really his last bona fide hit, a film he made on his own terms, released in the cuts he wanted and was successful. Outside of that, the only other successful film he had was Christine, which didn't perform as well as other Stephen King adaptations, and, and Starman, which people often don't think of as a John Carpenter film because it has a, a very different kind of sense and style to it. But um, all of the other films were unsuccessful. The Thing, Box Office and Critical Failure, as was Big Trouble as was They Live, as was Memoirs of an Invisible Man, one of my favourites, um, Vampires on Mars, Children of the Damned. So, you know, for every hit he's had, he's had at least two misses. And so I think if John knew what was going to capture lightning in a bottle, he would have repeated it. And he would have probably tried to repeat it for the sequel, Escape from LA, which has just been restored in 4K. Mm. Even though that's a newer film, it's only, what is it, 15 or 20 years old? It's, um, I don't think it's aged quite as well as Escape from New York, mm -hmm. which almost seems timeless, despite the photochemical special effects and everything else. I think the folks at Studio Canal have done a great job restoring it the way they have. But I don't think you'd want to do a George Lucas and go back and tinker with the, uh, with the effects on this one. No, I doubt it. I mean, the funny thing is, is I always think Carpenter's films are ahead of their time. The crazy thing is I watched the Escape from LA recently and it's set in 2013. And the funny thing is Cliff Robertson's president actually echoes a certain contemporary president. But the interesting thing is, is the movies are actually, I mean, the thing, for example, actually is a premonition of COVID because that's how I look at it. It's a pandemic film, effectively. You know, it's paranoia. I mean, with Escape from New York, for example, I think the wonderful thing about it is, is we bought into the visuals. I mean, I, I, I wanted to have a computer display like that. And then I suddenly realized it's all physical effects. And having just read the, the stuff about how it's a testament of how cleverly it was shot because we had those, you know, I felt that I didn't really, I felt it was in New York. I mean, the great thing is that wonderful dissolve shot from Liberty Island to the, to the dams in, in LA. I mean, I thought that was a fantastic thing, but this is a testament to how great it is. So going back to the book, I mean, obviously when you were designing the book and how, how did you coordinate specifics? Cause you, you know, cause obviously you can't just throw things in randomly and hope it works. I mean, obviously how much thought went into the design itself? Well, everything is led from, if you like, the, the story treatment. So all of these books, when I write them, I create a treatment for the publisher. And that's sort of like a two or three page document, very much the way in which I'd create a television or feature film documentary treatment. So you can get a sense over two to three pages, what you're going to see, how you're going to see it, and roughly in what order. And, and then I'll attempt to, to write the book. And so the photos and the images are dictated then by what follows. So if you imagine writing a, a, a 
fictional story and you've got an illustrator in to then illustrate those scenes those kind of standout moments that's what happens here you know you find the images that are the best standout images to describe how they went to St Louis to try and find an, an alternative to New York or the Sepulveda de Dam as you mentioned um and, and even the shots around Liberty Island you know it was one of the very few times that people were allowed to film that close to the Statue of Liberty at that time because the New York Film Office hadn't been fully established. So all of those kind of stories that I tell in text and with interviews, we're trying to find the best possible imagery to go with that. Sometimes you get a few surprises. I mean, the folks down at uh, New World, uh, Bob Kaiser, who was head of special effects down there and working with the Skotak brothers, he had the original Joe Owl's production drawings that even Joe didn't have. So he shared them with me and they're in the book. So it's interesting what um, some people keep in their sort of long archives. And those discussions then extend and expand on, if you like, the three-page premise that I'll pitch to a publisher. But it's tricky because publishers make the commitments, they'll contract an author like myself, and the financial ball has started to turn, even though we're not sure if we found all the right images. I mean, even the image on the cover here, we needed a high-res version of Barry E. Jackson's cover art. And there's different versions of it in different places, but they're not particularly high res enough for a book. And mm. the amount of images I had that were good, but not good enough. And I had to keep looking and keep looking to find them. Um, we were helped by fans, by film libraries and Studio Canal had their own archive of, of material as well. So, you know, I'm very conscious that when people are paying this amount of money and getting a large format book, they want to see either images they know before, but in a better quality, or preferably images they've never seen before, and stories about the production that have never been told. Yeah, definitely. I have to say, that's one of the things that I love about the book, is I love those those behind the scenes shots. You know, there's a scene with, there's one picture of Dick Warlock, who was a long time stuntman, and, and I love the, 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 you know, the ensemble picture with um, with Isaac Hayes, with Dean Cundy and everything else. But it's the wonderful thing that the fact is you are tapping into you know, today, for example, this film is so familiar to fans, it's sort of grown in stature. So obviously, you, we're talking about this book, you've published books by Flash Gordon and Ray Harryhausen. So obviously, when you have this kind of success with books, I mean, does it, and other books about films and filmmaking, I mean, does it open up doors for you? I mean, do you, is it always fighting for that next opportunity? Yeah, it's, it's well, it's, it's this... Um... It's kind of, in some ways, it's sort of the reverse of that. It kind of closes doors because there's only so many hours in the day. If, if I'm doing a book, then it's going to take me away from doing other film work. When uh, I wrote Harry House and the Lost Movies, I was approached by a publisher who'd seen me talking at Comic-Con, and it was Comic-Con at the Excel Centre in London. And he said, so oh, I think this would make a great book. You're talking about the Harry House and Archive and some of these projects that never saw the light of day. And I kind of thought, yeah, sure, you know, I guess it wouldn't make a book. And they told me they, they were publishers and I, my ears kind of picked up. And I thought, well, maybe there is something in this. Um, but I never thought that I'd have a second book. And this is my third book, Escape from New York. And, and as we're speaking today, John, in, in sort of March uh, 2022, I finished two more books. So I have two coming out this year, one in September and one in November, neither of which I'm allowed to reveal at the moment because um, the, the IP holder will tell us when, um, we're allowed to announce. I think it's going to be very soon. I think it is this month. Um, but the market for books went up in lockdown. I was available more to write the books and more people were available to speak to me to talk about the books that I was available to write that they were available to chat to me about. So it's 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 sort of one hand kind of uh, washing the other in that sense. But they do open up opportunities because speaking to the rights holders for Flash and now for Escape from LA and because I'm a program maker we've been talking about the possibilities of either doing a long-form documentary on any of these including Harryhausen the Lost Movies or in the Harryhausen case it's basically a pitch book for all of the films Ray Harryhausen tried to make but didn't manage to get the funding for including the official sequel to Clash of the Titans which would have been called Force of the Trojans so there's, there's lots of potential in all of these books to revisit. And I was speaking to a group of people uh, recently in a, in a large form interview about uh, Escape from New York coming back, but not being remade as a feature film, but as a rather expensive 10 part uh, television series for a streaming service. And I think when you think of some of the successful streaming dramas, 
they have a, a, a much thinner premise than Escape from New York. And Escape has all of the interesting backstories of, of course, Snake Plissken in Leningrad and what would have happened, the bank robbery sequence. I would love to have seen more of Donald Pleasance and the president and the, in the White House and boarding Air Force One and the issues with the terrorists he had on Air Force One. I mean, I would watch that, wouldn't you, John, if it was a 10-part series yeah. for a streaming I mean, service? The, fun, the funny thing is, is I remember John Brosnan, the late John Brosnan, reviewing, Starbur reviewing it for Starburst, and he actually felt that it lacked potential at the time. This was an toothpaste from start. It was an interesting thing, but we were, we were born into that. And also as well, um, talking about Harry House, I mean, it's the 40th anniversary of Clash of the Titans bearing, you know, arriving. So I think the time is right for it. I mean, I'm certainly curious to know what these other two titles are, but I will let you do that because obviously embargoes are important, particularly for me as a critic, for example. So just changing the subject slightly, you're a trustee of the Harry House and Foundation. I see on your Zoom, you're actually down as the Ray and Diana, Harry House and uh, Foundation and stuff. So what is your specific involvement? I mean, how important is it to preserve the legacy of things like this for future generations? Oh, massively so. I mean, I, I first met, in fact, you can just see me there. There we are. Look, I first met Ray Harryhausen when I was an 18-year-old film student at the London Film School, and I made a documentary about his life and work. And uh, that's the original Kraken from Clash of the Titans, looking minty fresh. Um, you know, Ray asked me to become a trustee because his collection is vast. He was one of those people who kept who kept everything. He kept all of the materials from the films he made and then all of the materials from the films he didn't make. So on the cover of the book, Harry Howes and the Lost Movies, you can see artwork on the uh, top here from the uh, Isle of Bronze, where Talos um, lives, or kind of stalks. There was expanded sequences planned for that. War of the Worlds is next, then Baron Munchausen just behind my head, and then beneath other stuff from the Golden Voyage of Sinbad that never made it through. So we have 50,000 items in the Harry Howes and collection, making it the largest archive of its kind outside of the Walt Disney Company. And so Ray was keen that people didn't forget his work and his technique. And of course, we're keen to tell people who he is and also you know, keep the spirits of his films alive. But of course, that's been done by the fans and the studios because they keep reformatting them and, and, and selling them again in, in sort of 2K and now 4K. But we have exhibitions and we regularly show the work around the world because other than it being about animation, it really is about the film industry. Very few filmmakers ray was a producer we mustn't forget that he was not a technician for hire he was the producer on these films too very few film people keep anything they let the studios take the original negative some of the trims if there are any but all the other paraphernalia goes goes to the wind and ends up either in prop houses or at the bottom of um, large dustbins so ray's unique in that sense as well his archive is 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 part of cinema history and so if you're interested in cinema history and you like to look back and find out what could have been and what should have been, those deleted scenes for Clash of the Titans, of which we found so far two or three. Um, but it's really, it's not for fans, I suppose, who might watch a film and flick it off when the end titles come up and, and wouldn't see us again. It really is for fans who are interested in finding out that next step and, and just digging deeper. So for everyone who's seen whether it's Clash of the Titans or Jason the Argonauts, they might say, I don't want to see that again. But there will be people like us, John, who will be like, oh, I want to see something extra. I want to buy the book. I, I, I want to find out, you know, what were the stories around at the time? You know, why did yeah. Ray Harryhausen choose this and not that? And, and they're all in here. You know, the, the skeletons in Jason and the Argonauts, that whole sequence was to be set at twilight. But the British Board of Film Classification read the script through, which they, they often do as a courtesy, uh, these days they charge you for it and they advise in advance what certificates you might expect to receive. So Ray decided to film this in, in a kind of a daytime um, because he didn't want to receive a, a higher certificate, which would have been a, um, a barrier to the audiences going in. And, and the skeletons, uh, of course, then emerge from the ground in the daytime. Originally, the seven-headed hydra that's guarding the fleece is guarding the entrance to Hades, to hell. And it's there originally that Jason is chased in by the Hydra, disturbing the soldiers, uh, the graves of dead soldiers. And that's when the children of the Hydra's teeth emerge. So it would have been quite a bit more spooky and atmospheric to have shot it like that 
Yeah. I mean, I, 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 yeah, I did meet Ray Harryhausen at the NFT once. He was at the, mm. he was at the Monsters Incorporated masterclass in the audience. And actually he was outside in the, in the old car park. And I did say to him, I said to him, Talis is one of my most favorite sequences. And he was very complimentary, lovely guy. I mean, um, so we know that you're active as a filmmaker. I'm just curious to know, I mean, how influential is John Carpenter to you as a filmmaker? Oh, enormously. I mean, when I shot my first feature film, Monarch, about the death of Henry VIII, um, you know, I had that in mind, you know, the 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 kind of the wide frame and allowing things to enter and, and, and emerge from and the importance of music as well. You know, I would sit with um, composers working on spotting sessions and I have in the past on other drama projects used uh, John Carpenter music as, as temp track music. And I know John Carpenter used different uh, musical acts and synthesized acts of the day to temp track Escape from New York. Um, and, and in the book, Alan Howarth uh, talks about that and about um, Ennio Morricone working on the thing and so on. But I think any filmmaker whose work seems as fresh and original as it does today, as it is 40 years ago, has done something, you know, has captured a moment. And he hasn't allowed, if we think of maybe some of the, uh, the remakes that have been less successful, the remake of Clash of the Titans in 2010, which was a financial success, but people felt it lacked the spirit and soul of Ray Harryhausen's original. And in last year's legendary pictures, Godzilla versus King Kong, or is it the other way around, King Kong versus Godzilla, which I thought, okay, this looks great. But when I saw it, um, it was like, oh, it was, it was quite the mess. And by the end of it, I wasn't sure who'd won or who'd lost, or even if I was paying attention. So I think the important thing is not to go in with a technique or a style, until you've seen your rushes and start to get a sense of how the pacing is going. And I know John didn't fully storyboard everything, partly because he wanted to see um, what he was getting in dailies or in rushes, and he wanted to see the ebb and flow of the story and what worked and what didn't. And, you know, there was a lot of anxiety around using Kurt Russell, for example, who'd never done anything like this before and carrying the whole film. The studio wanted uh, Charles Bronson, who would have been an unusual choice with our 2022 eyes. But had we been back there in 1981, we would have thought, yes, the guy from Death Wish, he would have been perfect. So I think it's important to recognize that John didn't allow sort of style and technique to overtake the story. And I, you know, one of his best thrillers is, um, is The Thing. And one of my favorite scenes in there is, is the blood testing scene where they're all tied to the chair that John was able to create both um, tension, horror, and humour in, in, in that whole sequence. Not wishing to spoil it for anyone who hasn't seen the thing, but that is, is kind of a standout moment for me. And it, it carries all of John Carpenter's best skills as a filmmaker, as a storyteller, and, and really as a kind of an Alfred Hitchcock of his time. Because once Hitchcock had gone and stopped making films, there were very few people to kind of take that mantle on. Brian De Palma, perhaps, some people think. Um, with Dress to Kill and, 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 uh, and other films. But I think, you know, John Carpenter was with Halloween, with The Fog, um, and uh, Janet Lee was in, of course, The Fog as well from, uh, from Psycho. I think John Carpenter is probably the most natural inheritor of Alfred Hitchcock's uh, sort of thriller chair. But mm -hmm. um, no, I think very, very few filmmakers would say that they're not influenced by John Carpenter in his films. Oh, yeah. I mean, he always says, you know, people ask him, you know, where did you get your staff? And he goes, well, I nicked it from somebody else. Um, I mean, just going back briefly, there's a very funny quote I heard recently about Harry House and somebody saw Jason and the Argonauts saw the Talis sequence and he was a film student in one of the top schools in America. He said to me, this is the worst CGI ever. I thought that was crazy. <laughs> um, anyway, John, um, we're going to wrap up in a minute. I've got three more questions for you. So have Carpenter and others seen the book? Yes, they have. Yeah. So everyone who's worked on the book has got copies of it. Um, and, you know, we've been hearing back from everyone. They're really enjoying it. So we've been talking about doing other Carpenter books um, so that other stuff is potentially on the horizon. And it, I think it's always key to coincide these with anniversaries. So if it's the 40th of something, so my kind of 40th and 50th clock in my head is looking back saying, what was big 40 years ago or, um, or 50 years ago even? So, um, but if we think of the films from 1981, a few of them have been remastered in 4K. You know, John Carpenter's films always got there first. You know, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Clash of the Titans, Dragon Slayer, 
Uh, I think Great Muppet Caper, Superman 2, depending which country you were in, all of these were the big films for 1981. Mm -hmm. Well, only Escape from New York went to 4K. It went to 4K about two or three years ago. And so John cooperated with all of those processes and, and, and getting the films to look as good as they could. I think it says a lot. I think it says a lot if your film is being 4K'd ahead of Steven Spielberg's Raiders of the Lost Ark, which I think it was only last year when it had its 4K debut. And it is a big investment, you know, to people don't 4K these films just to keep filmmakers happy. In fact, they're not interested in that at all. And these books don't get written just as a tribute to great filmmakers. They, they, has, they have to be commercially viable. Um, I mean, this sold out with its Amazon run in the US on day one of publication. So luckily, because of pre-sales, publishers know if they're going to sell out fairly soon by doing the advance orders. That's part of the reason you can buy things early on Amazon. So second print run was ready to, to come straight in there. Um, but it, it's, it's difficult. And I, and I think I must say this as well, John, we've not been able to do um, book signings. So I've been offering book plates. One, one is on its way to you now. It's already in the post. Thank so um, we're, we're saying to people who want to uh, have a book plate, you've got to work for it, of course. You've got to send us a screenshot of your Amazon review, and then I'll send you a signed, dedicated book plate. And it's quite nice because it has our this kind of logo from the film on it and some rain. And so I'll sign it and you can stick it in the uh, in the front page of the book. So it's as if you'd seen me at a signing. Yeah, well, I, I certainly will. I look forward to that. And thank you very much. So my final two questions is, what advice would you give other people who want to write books about their favourite films and TV shows? I think because I approach this from a kind of a, a slight geek perspective, I would always imagine, gosh, if I ever got the chance to ask, why did they do it like this? And how did you manage to fly this sequence and so on? So I'm, I'm quite interested in the magic behind the curtain. And so special effects is often my in point and, and partly with Ray Harryhausen, that was the case as well. So I think if you have an enthusiasm for a project, but I think the thing to bear in mind, of course, is that there are lots of fans of these films. So when I was writing the Flash Gordon book, a few fans weren't that happy because they said, oh, I wanted to write a book on Flash Gordon. And I was like, oh, sorry, but there can be only one, as Highlander would say, there can be anyone. Um, so it's, it's, it's difficult. You know, these books sometimes choose me and sometimes I, I choose them. But I think if, if you've got um, maybe contacts with some of the people involved, the real difficulty in making an official book, you have to have a license from the film company who owns it. And some film companies like Warner Brothers will not issue licenses to write books on their classic films. Whether it's Gremlin, Superman, the movie, um, the Batman films with uh, Michael Keaton, Warner Brothers will not do it. It's, it's policy. So they will license other products like soundtracks with booklets and so on. But um, I think that's a bit of an odd one. And hopefully that will change in the, in the future years. But if you make a list of the books you want to write, approach some publishers and say, look, I'd like to do a making of a book like this, but be ready for those difficult questions when they say, well, have you got the rights? Do you know if there's enough assets? Are you in touch with any of the cast and crew? How quickly can you write it? How many words will it be? And how many photos can we expect to see? It's kind of like, I don't know the questions of any of those. I can only tell you what my name is. Um, they'll need to know a bit more than that. Okay. And my final question, I mean, I kind of sense this, you all, you've already answered this a lot through this interview, but I mean, what are you most proud of about this book? Um, I think because like Flash Gordon, there was so many contradictory stories flying around. It was great to be able to finally get people together and say, look, come on now, what happened here? Is it true? Charles Bronson was nearly cast. Tell me the story about how... Um, Kurt Russell was nearly brained by by Ox Baker in the uh, in the ring, and, and Dick Warlock, his his stunt double, was nearly killed. Um, how true were those stories? What's the story of John Dykstra from Star Wars being involved with the FX? James Cameron, of course, famously we know was involved, but to what extent? And is there more pictures and information? So for me, it was an opportunity to to set the record straight and to do a follow up to Flash Gordon because people really liked. The way I did that and the way I chaptered it as if it was a documentary feature. So this, the book isn't written in the necessarily the order the film was shot, but it is written in an order that tells the story in, in a way that's kind of compelling and that has a, a, a natural beginning, middle and an end. So I'm hoping that people who read it in one sitting 
all people who choose to kind of chop through it will have the same experience. Mm -hmm. Well, John, I mean, I have to say that I'm I'm certainly going to be reading this book again and again because it's always it'll be a nice therapeutic thing at the end of a nice long day. As mentioned, thank you so much for your time and insights today. John has been brilliant. As I say, the aforementioned book, which I have here, which will have its book plate soon, will be available, is available on Amazon and other book outlets. And for more on John, you can go to his website, www.johnwalshfilmmaker.com. For more articles, interviews, and reviews for myself, you can go to www.filmandtvnow.com. And you can watch a replay of this interview on the, my official YouTube channel, John Higgins Film Review. Thank you, John. And thank you one and all for watching. Thank you. My pleasure.